Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie. I am a former midwife and board certified lactation consultant, and I am currently an epidemiologist working in COVID-19 vaccine confidence. Um, I'm here talking with Dr. Fiona Matatal, an OBGYN in Calgary, Alberta. Hi, Fiona. Hey, Stephanie. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, so um, my name is Fiona Matatal, and um, I, uh, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist in Calgary. I have a general practice. Um, I did my training at Queen's University, then out to Halifax and came back to my home in Calgary. I work in a general practice um, in overall reproductive health, but about half of my practice is uh, in obstetrics in high risk and a few low risk pregnancies. And sadly in Calgary, we've had a large number of pregnancies affected by a COVID uh, infection. And I've had a number of patients myself um, go through this and um, it's been an interesting year, navigating a lot of data coming at us quickly, trying to synthesize that and help inform patients uh, in terms of um, best care for, for them. And, and I'm really happy to be here to share uh, the experience we've had. Great. So yeah, we decided to create this video to support healthcare workers um, in staying up to date on recommendations for COVID-19 vaccination in pregnancy and lactation, um, and also to highlight some of the consequences of COVID-19 in pregnancy and, and bring a little more nuance to that conversation. So um, Fiona, we hear every so often that uh, pregnant people are often being told by their providers to um, wait until after pregnancy to get the COVID vaccine, um, but that's kind of in conflict with some other recommendations. Can you talk a little bit more about what's happening there and what the recommendations for pregnant people actually are? Yeah, um, I, and I think we all come to pregnancy as healthcare providers with an air of caution, um, and we, we never reach for the the newest drug on the on the table. You go back to some of the older ones that have been studied for a long time, and this is a challenge we have in this pandemic. Is is things are moving quickly, and we have vaccines that have. Uh, have been developed for the last 15 years, but not the last 50. Um, I think early on there were concerns about, um, you know, and, and questions more than concerns about safety and efficacy in pregnancy. And we have now well borne out in the literature um, evidence that the vaccine is uh, effective in pregnancy and there's no reason to delay this vaccine between pregnancy to um, postpartum because it will be as effective uh, in a pregnant patient as a non-pregnant patient. Um, also in terms of safety, um, we have very good safety data. We can dig into that data if you like um, on specifically looking at outcomes of pregnancy and postpartum for patients who've had the vaccine in pregnancy. Um, and additionally, we've got not only safety data for the pregnant patient, um, but we have evidence of benefit for uh, the fetus and newborn when uh, the patient is vaccinated during pregnancy. So our current recommendations are to not delay uh, vaccination, that it should be given either, whether the patient is attempting pregnancy, first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, does not matter. Best to get the, the vaccine uh, as soon as it is available to that patient. Great, yeah. So, you know, the way that we, um, gain evidence about safety in pregnancy um, with vaccines and medications has to be a little bit different um, than the rest of the population, right? So, um, you know, while it is sort of controversial, at this point, most clinical trials exclude pregnant and lactating individuals um, from their testing. And so the way that we find out about whether um, a medication or a vaccine is safe is through people just taking it, right? Um, and then keep keeping an eye on how they do. So um, during pregnancy, we rely on real world data um, and surveillance data. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. So we collect information on uh, any adverse outcomes. We call them adverse events um, following immunization. Um, and in the US, there's a database called VAERS uh, and the vac vaccine adverse vaccine adverse events reporting system. So following a vaccination, if anybody uh, has any sort of medical condition, anything that happens, they can report that then 
two, um, two VARES. And that um, then is kind of looked through by biostatisticians and epidemiologists, and they're looking for safety signals. So things that are coming up more often than you would expect to see in the general population. So one of the things that has come up a lot over the course of the pandemic is this is open source data, which is so wonderful. I believe in that so much as a, as a scientist. Um, but it means that you can just go look at it. And if you go and look at it, you will see all kinds of different things listed. Um, and that can create some fear, but that is not how that is used, right? So we, we use that information on a large scale statistical um, uh, scale to detect, um, you know, differences. It is not um, even indicative of correlation, uh, let alone causation. So a lot of these things are coincidences. Um, it is, it's really um, normal for people to misrepresent that. So you may in your practice hear somebody come to you asking about VARES. So it's important to understand how that system works. It's a surveillance system. Right. So when it comes to pregnancy, um, we, we learn about pregnancies through uh, VARES, so they are reported to VARES, but we also, there's also a program called VSAFE. And I'm gonna let you speak to, to VSAFE, Fiona, and the, the data that's come out of that. Right, and thank you for that background. It's really helpful um, to have an epidemiologist explain how all of this works. Um, and um, VSAFE is, I think it's amazing. So, um, Frontline healthcare workers who were pregnant um, back in late 2020 and early 2021 who chose to become vaccinated um, with either Pfizer or Moderna um, allowed for um, collection of data. Um, and my understanding, it was all done by cell phones, which is, I think, so, uh, so amazing and was sort of going forward prospectively looking at complications in pregnancy. And, you know, from an obstetrician's point of view, there are certain pregnancy outcomes that I look at to see, okay, is this um, whatever the medication or vaccine is, is it safe at that point in pregnancy. And so in the VSAFE data, um, and it is being updated as time goes on, as those pregnancies, you know, more and more of those pregnancies have completed and we get more data going forward. Um, the last I've heard, we have just over 19,000 um, patients who had Pfizer and 16,000 who had Moderna that this data is collected on. And like you said, Stephanie, what they look at is what are the incidents of a, an outcome and then compare that to what is the background incidence of that in the population. So for instance, looking at sort of first trimester um, outcomes, one would be miscarriage rates. Um, and miscarriage rates can be tricky to um, identify, but what in the um, United States population where this data is being taken out of, the uh, rate of miscarriage is ranges from 10 to 26% based, you know, looking at populations. And the specific number coming out of VSAFE was 12% of uh, patients who had the vaccine had a miscarriage. So when you compare that 12% miscarriage rate um, in patients who had the vaccine compared to a range of 10 to 26% in the general population that we would expect um, as what is normally occurs, we are not seeing an increase in that rate of miscarriage. So that was reassuring data from early on. Um, another um, first trimester outcome that is of interest to us as obstetricians is are there uh, any increased risks of congenital anomalies or anomalies that um, would be identified on ultrasound or seen after birth? And in the VSAFE data, they found a 2% uh, risk of anomalies in, um, in the fetus or baby born to that pregnancy that was vaccinated and the background rate in the US is 3%. So um, we are not seeing an increase in uh, anomalies or birth defects. So again, reassuring. When we look at other pregnancy outcomes um, going along sort of into second and third trimester, uh, they look specifically at rates of small for gestational age or babies who have not reached their growth potential. 
they found it was identical to the background rate at 3%. Um, Preterm birth was 9%, which matches the background rate of between 8 and 15% in the United States. And then one um, very important outcome that we always look at, and thankfully it is rare, which is an intrauterine fetal demise or stillbirth. The stillbirth rate was 0.1% in patients who had received the vaccine, um, which is on the low end of what the estimate is for the population um, rate in the United States, which should be less than 1% of pregnancies result in stillbirth. So overall, when I'm looking at those individual um, metrics of complications in pregnancy, I feel very confident that the vaccine administered during the pregnancy is not going to put that pregnancy at increased risk. Great. Uh, those data are really reassuring. And then, you know, the, the next thing we need to do is to compare that to um, COVID outcomes. So what data do we have about the risks of COVID during pregnancy? So that is, that is the other piece of this puzzle. And when you're weighing pros and cons um, with a patient sitting in front of you, um, I think you definitely need to have that part of the conversation is the alternative is no vaccine, um, but possibly um, having an infection with the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, there is some good data coming out of a study called InterCOVID, which looked at cases of pregnancy um, with COVID infection in a number of different countries around the world. And again, that information is growing with time as there's more experience in more countries. Um, and we are seeing um, worse outcomes um, in those pregnancies. So for instance, we are seeing increased risk, risk of complications like preeclampsia and eclampsia, and it's about a 1.6 uh, increase in risk. Um, other infections in pregnancy, so whether that was another infection like pneumonia or an infection like chorioamnionitis, which you can have inside the uterus, uh, about a threefold increase in those in other infections. Um, the other thing we see in the third trimester is a risk of in, increased risk in preterm birth, and it's about a 1.6 uh, times increase in preterm birth. And then some of the more sinister complications, uh, about a five-fold increase in admission rates to the intensive care unit and patients needing um, such interventions like um, ECMO or intubation while pregnant. Um, and we're also seeing an increased risk of overall mortality and morbidity to the neonate, both in the immediate postpartum period, but also for a few days uh, following. So overall, um, COVID infection in pregnancy is something that you would really want to avoid. And I, when I'm talking with patients, I talk about ways to minimize that risk. So that's following health, you know, public health guidelines, masking, isolating, but biggest part of that right now is getting vaccinated for protecting. Right. Thanks for sharing that. Um, those are some really serious outcomes. So definitely something we need to take seriously. I think, you know, those outcomes are alarming, but they are still fairly rare. Serious COVID is, is fairly rare. Um, but then people get kind of stuck and fixated on that that rarity of, of severe COVID, um, partially, I think, because of um, the way that um, the initial clinical trials uh, determine which cases were mild and which were serious. It, it gave the sense of mild, kind of made it seem like a mild illness with COVID-19 was a, the sniffles or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we missed a little bit of the nuance in, in there about um, what the implications of COVID-19 can really be like. And I think about, you know, I've been a midwife and I also have uh, gestated and birthed two children myself and thinking about, you know, we're learning more and more about um, the prevalence of long COVID and people who are having really chronic um, health issues and respiratory issues and mental health issues associated with COVID. People who, you know, can't walk up the, up the set of stairs without becoming out of breath. And then I, and then I think about 
the challenges of pregnancy and how difficult pregnancy can be um, and about that shortness of breath you feel as your baby is sort of pushing up on your on your diaphragm and your lung capacity is reduced and you know just the exhaustion of postpartum and and imagining that with a viral illness and then the isolation implications so i think there's a lot more to the picture than just these big scary preeclampsia preterm birth numbers there's there's real quality of life consequences um, in this like once in a lifetime or twice or three times in a lifetime however many times you <laughs> you do it this this time period that's really you know challenging and also supposed to be really powerful and transformative so i'm curious you know from your standpoint as somebody who's been been working clinically um, with pregnant people uh, and postpartum people during this pandemic what have you seen to that effect fiona you know, Stephanie, those are really good, uh, really good points. And I think all of those challenges um, that are already present in pregnancy and birth and postpartum um, are harder um, in not only the setting of the pandemic, but for someone who say has COVID, but maybe a mild case of it. So not the severe um, complications like we talked about, like preeclampsia or ICU stay. And I think, you know, from a physical standpoint, um, the the tough parts of pregnancy are, um, you know, carrying a baby, the increased respiratory load, the increased cardiac output, and when your cardiovascular system and respiratory system are challenged additionally because of an infection and pregnancy on top of that, it can be even hard just getting around day to day, sleeping at night if you've got congestion can be harder. And certainly the, the work of labor and pushing a baby out um, is very hard. If you have, you know, anybody who's done that with, you know, a mild cold or influenza, COVID um, infection of the lungs can make that really hard. Additionally, because of the contagious nature of this and trying to protect ourselves as healthcare workers, we are asking uh, those pregnant patients to wear a mask while pushing in labor. And that is really, really hard, uh, very, very hard work. And I have been in, in those rooms um, with pregnant patients pushing with compromised respiratory um, systems and wearing a mask. And it's very, very hard. The, um, I think from the postpartum standpoint, there's, there's also physical challenges. Um, we know that uh, these patients are at higher risk of intervention for, uh, for birth. So that might mean an instrumental delivery, more perineal trauma, which is hard to look after as it is, um, but are uh, a slightly higher risk for cesarean sections. So to be recovering from surgery and trying to breastfeed a newborn, and we will all be really encouraging that patient to, uh, to breast or chest feed because of the um, additional antibodies that that newborn will be receiving um, while recovering from uh, respiratory infection is hard. And that's only the physical part. Um, when you think of the, um, the emotional recovery from, um, from birth, as we all know, baby blues are hard. Add into that the isolation if you cannot have people in your environment because you are afraid of COVID, but even worse, if you have COVID, you cannot have those same supports come into your home environment. So you can't have that necessarily that doula who's going to be there to help you with breastfeeding or having um, you know, people in your family or extended friends who would be that postpartum support for those new parents and that newborn. Um, and so there's even more isolation. Um, and I think the mental health challenges, um, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg of, of some of the, the fallout from this. Um, and then I think there's also the worry because we do not have long term information on how will these um, children born in COVID who've been exposed, their, their parents have been exposed to COVID in the pregnancy, how are they going to be long term? And, and there's a lot of uncertainty and stress for parents uh, in in that setting. So again, trying to reduce risk of exposure to the virus in the first place is the best thing we can do as healthcare providers. Yeah, that's that's great. That really helps um, you know, think about 
taking care of the whole person, right? Mm-hmm. There, people are not just, you know, the physical conditions that are happening in their body, but their circumstances and their situations. And especially in that perinatal time period, it's just such a vulnerable time. Um, and, and it's important to think about not just those um, serious, serious statistics, pardon me, mm-hmm. um, but, the, but the real implications for people's lives. I think that's yeah. really powerful. Mm-hmm. So as we're going through all this, you know, I've had um, the majority of patients I've had in the office who are pregnant um, have decided to be vaccinated, which has been really reassuring. Um, sometimes it's a little bit of trying to help some misunderstandings, but I'm wondering from your expertise, um, if let's say I had a patient who was vaccine hesitant, um, whether they're planning pregnancy or currently pregnant, um, what would you suggest are some, some tips and help that I could have? Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's been a fair amount of research done on vaccine hesitancy over the years as it's been a growing, um, a growing challenge. It's been, you know, I think it was 2019, the World Health Organization listed it as, as one of the leading threats to global health, and that was um, prescience. Um, so it is something that there's been a lot of research done on. Um, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about about how to correctly ad- address, not correctly, but best address um, vaccine hesitancy. And one of the things that that uh, got me interested as a midwife and lactation consultant, I, I dealt with a, a fair, um, a fairly vaccine hesitant population, and was really seeing missteps in communicating with them effectively. And a lot of, um, fortunately, there's been a sort of depolarization of that conversation a little bit with the ad, um, use of the term vaccine hesitancy. We don't label people as anti-vaxxers in the same way as we used to. Um, but I think the first first and foremost thing is that um, it's important to not assume that vaccine hesitancy is the result of a deficit of information or uh, of just of, you know, believing in misinformation. I think that that's um, our tendency as healthcare workers and people who love the evidence is to respond to people um, by just addressing bullet point by bullet point their misinformation or misunderstanding of the data. And that is um, in the literature, it is not an effective way to um, combat vaccine hesitancy. It is important to share information, but kind of coming back at people with those facts um, when they're expressing a concern is often alienating and can actually um, cause people to sort of double down on their beliefs instead of wanting to connect. So I think the, the best thing that uh, we can do as healthcare workers as, is to see people as complex uh, people. The reasons for their vaccine hesitancy com- can be really complex. Um, they are rooted often in, in just a, a fear or a, a deep caring. They're concerned. They want to be healthy. They want to be well. They want to make good choices. They love their kids. They want to make good choices for their kids. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of trauma um, that can, can contribute to vaccine hesitancy. So um, it might be a historical cultural trauma of, of populations who have had their trust broken um, by by biomedical systems, by healthcare providers, and it's important to just to just for us to be honest about that and to own it and to know that we haven't necessarily earned trust and respect. But as care providers, that's where you come in. Hopefully, you're in the position where you have earned trust of your patients, and it's important to connect with them, to listen, to hear what they're really saying, um, and to try to support them in gaining confidence. Um, so your own confidence in vaccines, your own confidence in, in, um, in COVID vaccines is going to go a long way in helping bring them on board and your connection with them. So create those connections, um, talk about why you got the vaccine, talk about um, and personalize it. They, you know, they have, each patient has their own specific um, health concerns that, that might make them more or less vulnerable to COVID, their own situations, what does their life look like? What would it mean for them if they got COVID? The research shows that that the strongest, one of the strongest predictors of vaccine confidence is a concern about COVID. So some people have a tendency to kind of brush it off and think it's no big deal. So it's nice to take a moment to think about what would it mean for you individually as a patient 
to have COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can kind of bring that back around um, to tailor the conversation to them and their concerns. So you do not need to dispel every myth about COVID. You can address their concerns, but address them, ad address them briefly. Um, you don't need to go down, down the rabbit hole unless, unless they take you down it. But it's good to pull it back to why, why, do, um, why is a COVID vaccine going to have a positive impact on this person's life and then help connect them to actually getting it. So sometimes um, there are, you know, there are a lot of situational or systemic barriers that prevent people from feeling comfortable. Um, one, one great example is people who have a really severe fear of needles or um, that is actually uh, up to 10% of people will avoid medical procedures or vaccinations because of a fear of, of needles. And so for those patients trying to make a plan to help quell their anxiety, trying to find a way to help them feel comfortable um, getting that vaccine, maybe figuring out if they can get it in an office versus a mass hub, something like that. So just thinking about the individual person and how you can really leverage your own trust with them and connect and hear their concerns and not just try to blast facts at them. Mm -hmm. Those would be my best pieces of advice. That sounds really, that's really helpful. Um, and, you know, these are things we did not learn in medical school. Um, so this is great to have um, evidence-based information on how to help people. And I think it comes down to basic things that we know how to do. Listen uh, to patient concerns, individualize, um, show by example. I mean, I wear my, my shirt to clinic and I'm very happy to tell patients with a big smile on my face, I was so happy to get vaccinated, to protect you, to protect my family. Um, and then going that next step and facilitating and knowing where, um, where the resources are to help patients get to that final step of being vaccinated. That is fabulous. Um, I guess another thing you mentioned was um, having information on the vaccines um, to have your own confidence in being able to you know, speak to patients with questions they might have. Um, one, one place I found quite helpful was our own society website. So the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada have a really good um, section on uh, information on the vaccine when it relates into reproductive health in general. Um, they do have some some good resources there, um, society statements, links to to research. I think those can be can be helpful. Do you have any other like online places people could go? Yeah, I, I really, um, when you're dealing with a lactation um, population, a lactating population, uh, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine is really fantastic for that. Um, it's just really, they, they have something for everything. So anybody who deals with pregnant or lactating people is gonna, is gonna find really helpful information there. So. Wonderful. It was so nice to talk to you today. This has been really great. Thanks for your time. Yeah, it was great. Thanks so much. I learned a lot. <laughs> great, me too.